Good evening, everybody. So I'm going to talk to you about this year's chemistry award awarded to these three scientists for the design and synthesis of molecular machines. And this is really a recognition of the uh, emerging field of nanotechnology here. So I'm gonna, just gonna go a little bit of the historical background here. In 1959, this really famous American physicist called Richard Feynman, he gave a public lecture and where he was mentioning that this phrase that there is plenty of room at the bottom. And so what, what he says, or what he was trying to say, is that he's basically saying by you know, making things smaller and smaller, uh, there is going to be greater and greater potentials in developing new technology and sciences. And so this really famously predicted the emergence of nanotechnology. And so in the past two decades, uh, you can sort of see there are a lot of technologies emerging that's involving nanotechnology, including things uh, in medicine, in materials, in energy, and electronics. And so a lot of these fields incorporated nanotechnology, but one of the very important development in nanotechnology is actually what I'm going to present about today, which is uh, molecular machines. And so molecular machines, like any other machines, uh, like you know, your cars, your bicycles, uh, they share very similar uh, properties or configurations. Right? So basically, it's, it's something that has to move, something that has to move, but it's on your command. When you give it energy, or come some kind of stimulus. Right? So mechanical movement. If you look at machines, right, whether it's a car, it's a bicycle, it's an elevator, there are common uh, themes or common criteria to say that it's actually a machine. So some of that in include things like, you know, there has to be movable parts that are interconnected, right? If you just have, you know, a piece of chair that doesn't move, that's not really a piece of machine. Machines also must move, right? So that includes linear motion and circular motion, motion or rotational motions, right? So Things that you see normal days, um, uh, things like you know hydraulic pistons or you know um, wind turbines or electric motors, right? So those undergo either linear or circular motions, and so those are the common themes uh, for machines, but also for molecular machines. And so before I go into exactly what these guys did for the development of molecular machines, I'm just going to give you kind of like a scale of things and see how small they are. Just a year after Richard Feynman gave his famous lecture, he proposed to the world and challenged the world to see, you know, how small can you build the smallest motor, right? And so, you know, very soon an American engineer came up with this electric motor that's only about 0.4 millimeters in size, and that satisfied all the criteria laid out by Feynman, and he got the Feynman kind of award, which is $10,000 uh, back then, which is a lot of money. And that, this is pretty much the best people can do back then in 1960, 0.4 millimeter. So how big is that? Well, if you put a human hair next to it, that's the size of a human hair, which is about 80 microns in size. Now, if you look at how big that is, well, a human red blood cell is about a tenth of that size, or eight microns. E. coli bacteria is only about one to two microns in size, and just a fraction of the human red blood cells. And what's really interesting about these uh, E. coli bacteria is that uh, you can sort of see there's a little tail behind it. And then uh, these are single E. coli cells that are basically swimming in water. And you see these helical things that's spinning around. Those are the propellers that propels the bacteria to go forward. And what's really interesting is those are, pro are, are propelled by a single molecular motor uh, that's done through millions of years of you know, evolution in, in biology, for example. This is what uh, people have been discovering about this molecular motor, is that there are lots of protein parts, and it, it's a very giant complex, but this motor is able to propel that giant flagella and allows the bacteria to move forward. And so this is what nature has been doing for you know, millions of years, and some the size of 40 nanometers. In the past 20, 30 years, human has tried to catch up to that, and uh, if you look at you know, this famous image where IBM created, you know, their logo with xenon atoms, this is only about four nanometers in size, right? So that's only a fraction the size of this molecular machine. Each blue dot here is basically one atom where IBM was able to move them in a particular ways and form this pattern. The molecular motor I'm going to talk to you about today is actually only a fraction of that, right? So this thing is only 0.6 nanometers in size and it's created in 1999. And you can sort of see in about 40 years of time, humans has been able to scale down the size of the smallest motor that they can create by roughly a million times, right? So that's really a great achievement. 
The first part of the story is going to go to the guy called Jean-Pierre Sauvage for figuring out how to put molecules together but have them interconnected. This is basically the technique that he developed, that he was able to join two molecules together into an interlocked ring. And so why is this very important or why is it a big deal in chemistry? It's because normally if you think about chemical reactions or what chemists do, we break molecules apart, we join them together, we form you know, different types of molecules. But these molecules are still very, very much joined together, much like you know, we make a chair or make a table. Right? Those are very good, useful objects. They have their functions, but they're not machines. So the very important thing is to have parts that can move uh, independently to each other, but still connected. And that's what's really important about his synthesis, is that he was able to create these two ring molecules that have absolutely no covalent bond to each other, but is able to move freely around each other in this fashion. With this advancement, uh, he was able to create an array of different types of molecules with different shapes that are all interconnected, but not exactly connected by a covalent bond. The next big step is done by Sir Fraser Stoddart, where he was able to create linear motion of two molecules. And what he did was basically created this molecule called rotaxane, where you have this ring molecules on top of this dumbbell molecule, where the ring can freely move around, but without falling off. Right? And so that's very interesting, because now, instead of you know, two molecules just in simply interlocking, you can actually move this thing linearly. And to be able to use this more uh, cleverly, he was able to create a control mechanism where you can actually move a ring by control to different locations on this molecule anytime you want. And so this forms kind of the basic building block or basic unit of developing more complex molecular machines. So later on, what he did was create a molecular elevator where you know, if you put three of these guys in a shaft and then connect all the molecules together, you can sort of, uh, he was able to lift this platform up and down, which is really neat, right? <laughs> this is very, very, very small. It's an elevator that can only elevate something by something like uh, you know, less than a nanometer. But still, you know, it's a very small mechanism, but allows you to really manipulate molecules at the nanoscopic scale. The next one he created is called a molecular muscle. Right? So to do this, what they did was joining the, the blue rod instead of to a ball, but to another red circle. Right? So by doing that, if you can control this type of motion, he was able to basically allow the molecules to shrink in size. And that shrinkage in size allows the molecule to actually pull on something. And they were actually able to put this on the surface and see that you know, they can actually control the contraction of a macroscopic object, which is really neat. That is the first two. The third one, the third big step, really comes from a guy called Bernard Fringa and his team, where he created the first molecular motor that can actually spin. Right? So in his design, this is the molecular motor that I showed you. It has this double bond here, carbon-carbon uh, double bond here. And so when you shine light to this molecule, that carbon-carbon double bond undergo photoisomerization, and that will spin around. And then at a certain position, when you then heat it up, it's going to undergo a thermal relaxation. So it spins around another roughly 90 degrees. And then you repeat that process over and over again. This molecule spins around in one direction constantly. And this is actually a very big achievement, because when you think about molecules in a very small scale, they're pretty much all undergoing random motions. And that motion cannot usually be controlled, whether to have a molecule go left or right, or you know, spin forward or backwards. You know, things just happen in very uh, stochastic ways. So being able to do this thing in one direction consistently is really marvelous. And so you know, guys, like th these guys are really creative. Once they build a small part, they want to build something that's more interesting. And so there goes the nano car. So <laughs> once you have one unit that can spin around, why don't you build you know, an all-wheel drive car with four of these, right? So basically, that's the molecule they created. And it's only two nanometers in size. And that's about you know, a million times smaller than my car. And my car is only two-wheel drive. <laughs> and so that is the image uh, if you look sideways. You know, it looks kind of funny. You probably don't want to ride on this car. It's quite bumpy. But you know, being able to create something that's only two nanometers in size and that propels itself forward is a really amazing uh, achievement. So that was done in, in 2011, just like you know, five, six years ago. 2012, they were able to reverse the direction of the motor. And in 2014, they were able to create a motor that spins as fast as 12 megahertz. And so to put that in perspective, you know, 12 megahertz is 
720 uh, million RPMs, and that's way faster than any of your motors, right? So your car motor runs, you know, 2,000 RPM or so. Your hard drive spins at 7,000 to 10,000 RPMs. These guys can spin like way, way, way faster, and that's that's something that's really only possible when you shrink things down to the molecular scale. So you know the physics and laws governing things are quite different when you go from you know macroscopic world down to the nanoscopic world. And that's really one of the key things in nanotechnology. And so um, to kind of summarize, you know there are a lot of technologies through the years from the 1960s all the way to the present day. You know, in the very early stage of uh, development, you have people, you know, doing very basic chemistry reactions and reaction mechanism, just really trying to figure out the basic of things. And if you just go back in time and ask, you know, oh, do you foresee, you know, all of your research going to have all these applications? People will be like, mm, I don't know what's going on. I'm just doing this for fun, right? <laughs> but, but it's really these fundamental research that, you know, allows scientists to take baby steps and eventually learn to walk and taking bigger and bigger steps uh, that drives this uh, transform transformation from fundamental research to application. So, you know, over the years, people begin to understand the molecular architecture of how to put these molecules together, how to make different shapes, their interactions, and how to actually control the molecules to do whatever they want, right? Once you have all of these, that's basically the foundation for uh, scientists and engineers to actually go forward and develop applications in health, energy, materials, and electronics. And so, you know, all of these applications are really possible all to, all to the, uh, the breakthrough of these pioneers uh, in nanochemistry, and they basically laid the critical foundations. And for that achievement, they were awarded the Nobel Prize of Chemistry this year. Thank you. Thank you.